All right, welcome everyone to another week. And uh, let's pray and get started. So that post we see in phase of nine of the intention acting. Just again today for Pastor Paul and continue uh, that from next week. <laughs> let's pray and get started. Can somebody pray, please? Amen. Amen. All right. So let's just quickly. Um, all right. I'm sorry they were not able to hear you when you were praying. Uh, show it a bit. Um, and we'll take it later. Uh, you can hear me. All right. All right. So let's just quickly review what we did last week in the introduction, and then we will go forward. So. The, um, I shared a little bit about our uh, own personal journey and uh, starting different prayer groups and so on, and then uh, coming in and studying uh, APC. Uh, lesson number two, we were talking about the Holy Spirit uh, being our leader, where we need to depend on uh, the Holy Spirit. And I added some notes here, which may not be in your handout, so let's skip that. And uh, we started off lesson number three, which we focused on uh, uh, what are we trying to do? Uh, what do uh, how do we define this? So he said basically that when the Lord Jesus gave us the commission uh, to go and make disciples, he didn't give a strategy. He didn't say, you know, start plant churches. He didn't specifically say that. But he said, uh, the Holy Spirit will empower you. You'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And um, and uh, as in the book of Acts, as they progressed, uh, it was something that the Holy Spirit did. That everywhere they went, they preached. Churches were planted, or what we would call as communities of believers. They, you know, so when we say churches, we're not thinking in terms of church buildings. We're not thinking in terms of denominations as we understand today, but in the in the uh, in the Book of Acts, it was basically communities of believers, and they were just referred to as church in Jerusalem or the saints in Jerusalem or the saints in Philippi or this and that. This, that um, but some of the things that we were highlighted were that we want to see self-sustaining communities. That means these communities should be able to continue on their own without the church planter or the person who has brought the message having to be there all the time. They have to continue on their own, uh, which means they would have leadership from among themselves, their own leaders rising up, uh, which means in terms of finances, whatever is needed, they would be able to have that amongst themselves. Stop sharing. Um, settings. Oh, yes, it's from the webcam. Okay, let me just. Okay, now it should be better. It's better now? Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry, there was a little correction there. Um, so I'm going to check my settings again. Line and headphone. Okay. All right. Um, so, um, what was I saying? Yeah. So financially, they should not be dependent on somebody, you know, supporting them. It should be something that they are able to sustain themselves. And the third thing that we said was. Um, uh, the community, it, the community should be dynamic. That means 
they are strengthening new believers internally new believers are being strengthened and the community is also reaching out to their you know territory their region right? it's having influence uh, so these are things that we're looking for when you're planting a church or you're starting a work right these three things leadership financially community they should be self-sustaining so uh, we uh, we talked about the objectives uh, why are we planting churches in new places why are we uh, starting new ministries and we we gave some reasons here on page six uh, let me share this um number one we said uh, to establish and host god's presence right you, you all have the same notes right yeah you have the notes yeah same thing okay fine uh, establish and host God's presence. It means the church is the house of God in that place. It's the dwelling place of God, spiritually. Right? We want to disciple new believers. We want to influence the region. We want to multiply and plant new churches. Right? So let's start with lesson number four today. Any questions still now uh, from last week online? Any questions from last week? Everyone's fine? All right, so let's move forward. Lesson number four. It's important for us, especially in when we're doing church planting, is to have God's heart for the cities. All right, especially if uh, I, I would say the city where you've been sent to minister. Right? Yeah, generally, we should have God's heart for all people, all nations, all, you know, all cities, everywhere. That's, that's true. But also have God's heart for the city he has sent you. Uh, have God's heart for uh, the nation or the people he has sent you. Right? Uh, that's very important. Without that, it's highly unlikely that we will have the endurance to do church planting work if you don't have god's heart for that city or that region or that people right so when you think about all the missionaries who in the past who came and who started work in different parts of the world they went across uh, why did they do it you know some of them spent the entire life in you know a certain place why did they do that? You know, uh, because they had God's heart. Otherwise, they'd have quit and gone. And you know, if you think example, I can look at many examples. But you think of William Carey. He left uh, as a young man. He left his home country, uh, the the United Kingdom, uh, England. He came here and he spent the rest of his life here in India. Never went back. All kinds of things happened. Family, he lost family members, they died. Uh, it took more than, I think, eight years before he saw first person receive Christ. He had to learn Indian languages, uh, lots of things. But he stayed. I think he stayed for maybe 40 years or whatever, or a very long time. So we would say, like, why did he do this? Or how did he have the strength to do it? You know, going through so much. Well, it's because his heart was here. Right? God, he had God's heart for this people, for this nation. Um, and if you look at, let's look at a few scriptures. If you look at Matthew five thirty-five, right? Somebody could read that for us. It's very interesting. Uh, Matthew five thirty-five. How the Lord Jesus Himself refers to the city of Jerusalem. Somebody could read that for us, Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, verse 35. Nor by the earth, food, uh, for it is his footstool. Nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Mm. 
So, of course, the Lord Jesus is talking about here making oaths and all of that. But notice how he refers to Jerusalem. He says, Jerusalem, it is the city of the great king. And what an identity to have, right? Jerusalem, it is a city. But he's calling it the city of the great king. So it's like God has chosen this particular city to be his city. And uh, when we come in, when you look at the Re book of Revelation, Revelation 21, 22, after there are new heavens and the new earth, we read about the heavenly city, Jerusalem, coming to be uh, set on the new earth. You know? So for whatever reason, God has chosen this city to be his city. Now, that does not mean he doesn't care about other cities. I'm just, I'm just trying to show that the God of heaven has his eyes on cities. He picked Jerusalem to be his city, the city of the great king. But similarly, he has his eyes on all the other cities, what is happening, what the people are doing, what is going on in that city that comes up before God. One example to look at is in Genesis 18. You go back to the Old Testament. It's about Sodom and Gomorrah. And what's happening in that city is coming up before God. It's another way of saying that God is very aware of what is happening in that city. So you look at Genesis 18, verses 20 and 21. Genesis 18, 20, and 21. Uh, could somebody read that for us, please? Genesis 18, verse 20, 21. And the Lord said, because the uh, outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, uh, understand this uh, as as more of a, a a communication. You know what? How how God is saying? It's not like God didn't know what's happening in Sodom and Gomorrah, but the point is that what is happening in that city is 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 coming before God, and God is very aware. And God is paying attention to what's happening in that city, right? And um, uh, so this is just one example of the twin city of Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, that, that God is aware of what's happening in the city. And, and of, of course, God is omniscient. It's not like, oh, nobody told me uh, something is happening in Bangalore. Oh, nobody told me something happened. No. God is omniscient. He's all-knowing. All so he's very aware of what's happening in, in the cities. And it touches his heart. Uh, it moves the heart of God. And sometimes it also causes judgment. Right? That God says, OK, I need to intervene now in what's happening in that city. For example, we see. In the city of Nineveh, we got the book of Jonah, the Old Testament, and uh, it's it's interesting to read these verses. I know it's a very small book, um, but the story is about a city and how God is God desires to intervene in that city, and of course He is intervening through a human being. In this case, it was Jonah, the prophet Jonah. But the whole story is about the people in that city. Right? So let's read some verses. Uh, Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Somebody could read it, please. Jonah 2, 1 and 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, from the fish belly. And he said... Uh, Jonah chapter 1, Jonah verse 1. 1 and 2, please. Okay, sorry. Now the word of the Lord come to arise to go Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, 
for their wickedness and come up before me. Mm. So God is calling Jonah. Jonah, come. I need you to go. I need you to go to that city because there's so much of sin in that city. Right? And for many of us, uh, an assignment can come like this. God says, go to that city. Go to that people. Or go to that town. Go to that village. Go to that community. And nowadays, our cities, we will see later on, cities are very big. That means there are, it's like communities, many communities within the city. Right? So God can say, go to that community within that city. Go to that people. You know? So in this case, God is telling Jonah, I want you to go to that city. An assignment for him. Why? Because what's happening in that city, God is grieved there. He says, their wickedness is so great. I've seen their wickedness, uh, and, I, and, and, I, and I want to do something about it. Their wickedness has come up before me. Look at the end of chapter 4, uh, Jonah chapter 4, uh, verses 10 and 11. You see the heart of God for that city. Please read Jonah 4, 10 and 11. Jonah 4, 10 and 11. But the Lord says, you have had pity on the plan for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which come up in the night and perished in night. And should I not pity Nineveh that great city in which are made then 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and also much live stuck. Yeah. So these are two verses, but I think there's a lot of uh, lessons we can learn. You know, here's Jonah, a prophet of God. He's hearing from God. But he is more concerned about things like the plant um, that didn't that couldn't give him shade and the plant that withered away in the sun. He's concerned about those kinds of things. He's worried and he's you know he's concerned. And God is saying, Jonah, you're worried about the plant which died overnight. But my heart is for these 120,000 people in the city of Nineveh. And they have no understanding between right and wrong. You know, they can't even tell what's right and wrong. Right? So the thought that comes to us is, you know, sometimes, ah, some, I'll be like, sometimes I'll be like Jonah where we are so worried about some unimportant things, you know, we're concerned. I mean, I know we have responsibility on earth and we have things to care for and take care of. Yeah, that's there. But in terms of priority, right, what are we concerned about? Are we concerned about the things that concern God's heart? Right? And that, that was a disconnect. Right? Jonah was a prophet of God, but he was not connected necessarily to the concerns of God's heart. Yeah. So, so he, he couldn't understand. When God said, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. God, where you want to go? I want to go to Tarsus. I don't want to go to Nineveh. He, he's not feeling what God is feeling. Right? And so he wants to go in a different direction. So I think that's, that's uh, one lesson for us. But the thing I want to point out is God's heart is moved by what he sees happening among the people in the city. So when you think, uh, let's just use Bangalore for, as an example because we are here. So imagine God is looking at Bangalore city. There's all kinds of people. People from, I think, maybe every state in India. Are here. And maybe there are people even from outside India. Not maybe, there are people. 
Some, of course, come and go, but there are communities where people have come for a little longer term. Maybe they are here for one, one two years, three years. So this city is so big. It is so complex. Lots of things are happening. And God is watching, is seeing what's happening in the city. And we have to try to understand how God's heart is moved by what he is seeing in the city of Bangalore. And we're just using Bangalore as an example. This can be said about any place. Because God is omniscient. He knows everything. So as he looks in the city of Bangalore, maybe he sees the youth. It's a young people, so many young people. I, I, I don't know now what is the percentage of youth in the city. But I think it will be safe to say it is a big percentage, a lot of people, a lot of young people, because they come for education, they come for jobs. Uh, you know, a lot of people come to Bangalore. Their life gets started here. So it's safe to say, I don't know the exact percentage. We can do a survey. And he sees the young people. What is happening? Yeah. And he's, he's moved by that. He says, I want somebody to go and address that. Maybe he sees certain communities in our city. He's moved by what they're going through. Think about all the migrant laborers. So a lot of construction is happening. Everywhere construction is happening. But who are the people working? The people working are actually migrant laborers, mostly. Not necessarily locals. There will be, of course, some local people. But most of these people are come from all across the country as laborers, manual laborers, construction workers, working hard. They don't know local language. They don't know local food, uh, but they've come because they need to earn and send money to their families. And they are working hard, you know, construction, all those things. So many, so many, so many things. They're living in the hard conditions. And, and, and God's heart is moved. I need somebody to go there. I need to go to those people, like that. So you can think of different, because the city is so big. Nineveh at that time was 120,000 people. That's very small, 120,000. Very small. Bangalore, maybe 14 million people. Right? So God's heart is moved. Right? So the thing is, uh, we, our heart should be moved by what moves the heart of God for our city of any part of the world, right? wherever God has called you or called me, our heart should be moved. An example here is in Luke 19, uh, when, when Jesus was walking on the earth, you see this beautiful example, Luke 19, uh, verse 41 to 44, somebody could read that. Luke 19, verse 41 to 44. Luke 19, 41 to... 40. Four. Four. Now, as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known ever you, especially in, in, your, in this day, the things that make for you your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embedment around you, surrounded you, and close you it on every side and level you and your level you and your children within you to the ground and they will never leave in you one stone in, and never leave in you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation mm. see when you read the gospels we see many times uh, the heart of jesus being described uh, we see many times when the gospel writers will say Jesus was moved with compassion. But there are times, I think only two times, 
when the gospel writers will say Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Uh, only two times. He was moved with compassion. But in certain situations, he was so moved, he cried. He wept publicly. I mean, others saw him. Uh, I, 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 it's likely that he may have wept, you know, uh, in other times. But we're just going by the record, uh, what is recorded for us. One we know was during Lazarus, when Lazarus was dead. At uh, that time, the Bible says Jesus wept. But look at this one. Luke 19, another occasion where it says Jesus wept. That means he was so moved, uh, he wept, cried. People in, in front of everybody, people are seeing. In this case, what was he weeping about? He was weeping over the city of Jerusalem. He saw the city, and it says here, verse 41, He saw the city and wept over the city. That's very touching. Yeah. That, so the question we should ask is, you know, are we so moved by what is happening in Bangalore city that we weep over it? Sometimes we keep complaining, <laughs> oh, look at the road, so bad. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> you, <laughs> anywhere you go. <laughs> There are oil, there are potholes, problems, traffic, then pollution, noise, all kinds of things. We, we, so many things to complain about. It is true. I'm not uh, saying. But can we go beyond those things, the, you know, the not nice things? And as we consider the city, are there things in the city that will cause us to be so moved that we actually weep over the city? Right? That's when we can say, you know, our heart is connecting to the heart of God for the city. And if your heart is so moved that you weep over something, I don't know. Sometimes some people, they see the slum. They see... That might move their heart. Sometimes they see street children. Children are begging. That moves their heart. So many, so many different, different things, right? But God, this is not right. This should not be happening. I need to do something. So, whatever. For it will be different for each of us. But Jesus saw the city and he wept over it. What were the things he was saying? The city did not know. The city did not have revelation, spiritual revelation. It says, verse 42, If you had known what will bring you peace. That means they didn't have the understanding. So that's what he was weeping about. Only if you had known what could bring you peace. right? But now they're hidden from your eyes. You're not able to see. Because the city was so caught up in their own traditions. When we say city, we're talking about the people. The people in the city were so caught up by their traditions. They, could, they, they were reading the scriptures, but they could not see what, was, what God was actually doing to fulfill the scriptures. So they didn't have the revelation. And then he said, end of that, he says, because you do not know the time of your visitors. I mean, it's like, look, God is visiting you and you don't know. God is fulfilling all that the prophets have spoken for thousands of years. He's fulfilling it and you're not even aware of it. It's happening, you're not recognizing. So Jesus was moved by the spiritual, if you want to use the word, the spiritual blindness of the city. Because you do not know, you cannot see what will bring you peace. You cannot see your time of visitation. God is visiting you. You're not able to see it. And then he announced also that because you're not recognizing this, you're going to be destroyed. Which happened? AD 70, 
about 40 years later, Jerusalem was the, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. The enemies would come, and uh, there was there was there was terrible things happening. AD 70, uh, the, Ro uh, the Roman general Titus, uh, who later on became the emperor of Rome, at that time he was the general, and he came with his army, destroyed the temple. Uh, you know, really uh, uh, affected the city. So Jesus prophesied, foretold. But Jesus wept over the city. So, uh, you know, the question there in your notes, why did Jesus weep over the city of Jerusalem? Why did he do it? In this case, it was the spiritual condition. Right? So he was not weeping over, oh, you don't have a nice road, you don't have good water supply. No. He was weeping over the spiritual condition. You are not aware of the time of your visitation. You don't know the things that could bring you peace. The Prince of Peace is walking yeah, in your midst, but you're not recognizing it. So we should be aware of what God is doing. And uh, in Acts 17, the Apostle Paul, when he is preaching at Athens, he makes this powerful statement, Revelation, Acts 17, verses 26 and 27. Somebody could read that for us. Acts 17, 26, 27. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their three appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Mm. So, very, very, very interesting. When you look at these two verses, that God, God is involved in where people dwell on the earth. So it says here, verse 26, He has made from one blood every nation. So, yeah, all, all people all over the world, you know, we, we, we're the same, to live on the earth. And has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So God is involved. In the times and in the boundaries of nations. And you can, we can go even lower than that. We can say, God is involved in the times and in the boundaries of cities or communities. Where people dwell. He's involved. Yeah. And uh, it is not by accident. For example, we can say we talk about Bangalore city. It is not by accident that this city was founded. Yeah, every city will have a history. So Bangalore has a history. You think about, oh, uh, you know, so-and-so came and he set up, of course, in the days of the kings who come, he came, he set up a place here, and this became the city of Bangalore. So it has a history. But what Paul is saying is that God determines. That means God was involved in the time and in the boundary. That means where, when, and where a city or a nation were to be established. So God was involved in the when and the where of our cities, of our communities, of um, you know tribes, people in different places. Why is that tribe in that place? Why is that kind of people in that place? God is involved. He determined the when and the where of people living. And why did he do that? Verse 27. 
why and 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 and, and you know god's involvement in the when and the where of people living is for this purpose verse 27 so that they should seek the lord that means even in the in the uh, a creation or in the formation formation of cities tribes communities under all of that god's hand is involved and his purpose is that they should seek the lord so god's purpose we can say this god's purpose in establishing bangalore city is so that people in bangalore city should seek the lord it's correct to say that based on these two verses so you say why was bangalore city established spiritual standpoint from this verse god was involved in the when and the where of bangalore city being established and it was established so that people verse 27 so that people will seek the lord they might search for him that they might find him so foundational to every city is this purpose of god so that people would search for him seek him find him All right so when you and i are involved in reaching cities we are actually joining hands with god to fulfill this Acts 17, 26, 27. We are actually fulfilling God's original purpose for the city. Of course, the city as it grows may have so many uh, other benefits, you know, education, uh, industries, uh, all those things are there, will come. But underneath all of that, the foundational purpose for God being involved in the life of the cities or in the life of the city, is so that people would seek for him, find him, seek for him, and find him. And he's not far from any of us. So, this is God's purpose behind every city. You all with me so far? Yeah? And when we have a heart for the city we are actually joining with god god your purpose in having establishing bangalore so that every person who came to comes to dwell in bangalore should find you should seek you and find you and you're not far away from anybody now the city has evolved and maybe it became has become i don't know just example i'm not saying bad about bangalore but let's say the city evolved and maybe it became a very violent city, a very sinful city, a very uh, a city given to pleasure or whatever, you know, it's different cities have different things. Oh, it's like this, it's gone this way. That's the natural expression and that's the expression of sin and wickedness. And we will see Satan is also involved yeah, uh, in, the, in the things of the city, we will see that. But that does not take away God's plan and purpose for the city. It doesn't take away from the fact that God was involved in the when, the where, and the why of the city. Right? He was, he was, he determined the times, the boundaries, and the purpose for the city, every city, or every community, every tribe where they are. He decided, he decided, he determined. So even though things have gone, you know, in a different direction. There is sin and violence and this and that in the city. The purpose of God has not changed. It's still there. And we are here in some way to bring that purpose back. Some way. I'm not saying, you know, we will become kings over the city and, <laughs> you know, change the whole city. But we can do our part. Small. Some community, some part of it, because city is so big. But some something 
we can do, which is lined with this purpose of God. That people will seek him and find him because he is not far away from anyone in the city. Not far away. Nobody is beyond reach. So whatever community we may see in the city, example, uh, uh, think about the uh, well, well, we, Hijra, so that's like the the transgender type of people. Right? They, so when you think about this, you think like, oh, it's so difficult. How are we going to talk to them? It is very complicated to talk to that community, that kind of people. How, how are we going to talk to them? The Bible says, he is not far away from anyone. Verse 27. Though he is not far from each one of us. He is not far. So even for that community, he's available. And uh, if God sends someone, go to those that community, reach them. God will work through them. He's not far away from that community. We should not think that, oh, they cannot be reached. No. He's not far from each one of us. Okay? Any questions? We'll pause here for a moment. Um, any questions from anybody? Everyone's okay? Fine. So let's continue. So what should our response be? So we're talking about getting God's heart for the city. Right? God's heart for the city. What should our response be? How do we respond? Okay. God is interested in the city. He was involved in the when, the where, the why for every city. Fine. My part. What is my part? Jeremiah 29, 7 and 8. Jeremiah 29, 7 and 8. Yeah. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away, ca carried away captives and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. For mm. thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive seven you. To eight is, till eight is good. Yeah, seven and eight. Not listen to your dreams, which you caused them to be dreamt. Okay, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Um, Jeremiah 29, 7. So, at this point, when Jeremiah is speaking, God's people have been, have been carried away into exile, into a foreign country, into Babylon. So they must be really upset. God, why you brought me to Bangalore? Uttarakhand, so nice. <laughs> or wherever, I, you know. God, that my place is, my home place is so nice. Bangalore is so crowded, so noisy, so polluted. <laughs> so these people felt something like that. Huh? They have been taken from Jerusalem and they've been taken into Babylon, living there, foreign place, different language, different culture, different food. What is Jeremiah telling them? Of course, God is speaking through Jeremiah. God is saying, people, seek the peace of the city where you are. Seek the peace of the city where I've caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. So two things he said. So you're in this city. Yeah, it's not your city. You're in a foreign city, different city. But seek the peace. That means, God, I want you. I want the peace of God. I want the shalom of God, the well-being of God, the blessing and the prosperity of God to come upon this city. Seek the peace. I don't curse it. Don't speak bad about it. I'm not saying you ignoring problems, but you want the well-being of the city. And pray to the Lord for the city. Pray to the Lord for the city. So that is 
the attitude you and I must have for the city. God bless Bangalore city. Bless the city, God. Let your mercies be on the city. Let your goodness be on the city. And pray to the pray to the Lord for the city. Mainly, we're praying to the Lord for the people in the city. That's who God is concerned about. So, Lord, for the people and whoever God has put in your heart in the city. The city is big, lots of needs, lots of people, lots of different kinds of people. But whoever God has put in your heart for the city, you pray to the Lord for that city. So that's our heart. That should be our heart. We develop that kind of a heart for the city. Okay? And God is looking for intercessors for the city. We'll, we'll take a break. Uh, we'll come back and continue from there. So we must develop God's heart for the city. How? Desire God's blessing on the city. God bless the city. Let things go well in this city. Let the bad things come down. Let the good things increase. Let justice, goodness, peace, prosperity, let that increase. Let bad things, so violence and crime and uh, hate and all those things, let those things come down. And pray to the Lord for the city. And we will come back and continue on this. Let's go for a 10 minute break. Um, start up again at 11, sorry, 10 o'clock. Sorry.